that. So I guess without further ado, let's get into some container orchestration. <coughs> Pardon. All right, so we're gonna talk about kind of what is container orchestration, and I'm kind of flying blind without speaker notes here, so if I do this a good bit, I'm not, I'm not kind of like gimpy on the left side, it's just uh, trying to see what you're seeing. Uh, we'll talk about the different choices you can have there and why these are useful. So how many of you have heard of Docker, right? This container thing's happened, right? And I'm gonna take some uh, liberties to assume you've heard of that. But see, if you can make one image, that's great. It's when you have to kind of wield a fleet of these that it becomes sort of a, a burden to bear. So that's where these orchestration tools come in. So much like this shows, when I had a simple set of these containers, a real small trim app, I manage this probably individually and quite manually to handle these various containers, but it's, it's when I start wanting to scale that or deal with failovers or have these things replicate or even auto scale, that's the cool stuff, right? That I really wanna start leveraging these orchestration technologies that are out there. Now, the orchestration provides a lot of great promises. It gives us the ability to coordinate our cluster and offload a lot of our brain trust into a tool that can make decisions for us, such as where the next container gets built. We can describe how we like our environment to behave once and let an orchestration tool sort of take care of making that be true in the end. Um, complex containerized applications that get deployed are a beast to bear if you're trying to do each of those things on a per container management sort of basis. So using some sort of tooling under there is going to make your life a lot easier. So things like scaling and replication, building that next image, this is all stuff you can offload from your worries and trust that your environment can solve those problems for you. So we get a, la a laundry list of features that the various orchestration platforms will give us. So cool things like replication or managing volumes. So this concept of having persistent data in a containerized world uh, is, is absolutely necessary for most people's deployments and can be a little bit challenging to manage or make sure it interconnects with all the pieces you need. No longer do you have to sweat that. You can actually let the tooling do that for you. Service discovery, man, I remember when I was new to this space and trying to have just things talk to one another was so challenging for me in containers that it's great that now I can kind of describe those service endpoints once. And when I stand up that next web head in my containerized infrastructure, it understands how to just find that load balancer connect and connect to that back end database. And that's all great. Describe it once, use it a bunch of times. I love the top thing, you know, with monitoring, you can then trigger these auto healing things. And I've had the privilege to see a lot of Netflix infrastructure who does an amazing job of that in so much that they gifted to the world something called Chaos Monkey, which basically runs around in your infrastructure breaking things to make sure that your infrastructure is resilient enough to heal from that. And I would say if you can deploy Chaos Monkey in your infrastructure, you're you're on the cutting edge. If you, have, if you can let something loose in your infrastructure that breaks most of it all the time and still not encounter downtime, you've, you've architected well. And that's a real gift to sort of battle harden your environments. But now in our orchestration platforms, they, they do that sort of thing for us. Authentication and authorization, we always have somebody who's in security in the room. No, not this time, cool, so we can, yeah, who needs that stuff, right? Uh, Anonymous users for everyone. No, uh, we always want to make sure that the right people get access to the right things, and now we have the Run as root, yeah, that's right. Pseudo all the things. Um, rolling updates, inevitably your images have to get replaced, so you need, once you reauthor those containers, you need to find and replace them, the currently running ones with the new instances, so uh, it can handle that sort of rollout for you, minimizing downtime or eliminating downtime, I guess would be the name of the game. And then we wield this in all the ways we like, from the command line and through the GUI because they're all driven with APIs. <clears throat> so when we really get into it, when we logically want to group some containers together to say my app is this 10 stack of containers, we can define that once, and then that becomes sort of an entity it understands how to wield. Uh, that means that we could co-locate main applications. So when I want my web head to talk to a database container, I probably don't want those spread across my cluster. Those probably need to be really nearby. But when I deploy a second instance of my whole application stack, I probably don't want that on the same node in the cluster. I need that more dispersed so that I'm eliminating those single points of failure and can actually deliver that uptime that I'm looking for. And then when I have these really complex multi-tier applications, um, they can work together well, they can provide that uptime, and we can trust that without any intervention on my part that the tooling will ensure that we're making good on that by driving against some desired state I've declared. Um, 
was saying. Oh, yeah. So you get to describe into the algorithm how you wish for this to behave. And for me, it was always that burden of, oh, where should I put this next container? Where does that need to live? And once I've described that once, the algorithms will take care of deciding where it's going to build out another container, another instance of my whole app, if that's a group of containers, or a single container that needs to scale horizontally can can uh, not only be decided where it goes, a scheduling sort of feature there, but also discover its service endpoints, interconnect with the database or persistent volumes if it needs that, and that, that's, that's amazing. And we can define that along any number of constraints. So um, maybe load of the host, maybe CPU is what triggers that behavior, or maybe I want to ensure that I have at least three different locations in my cluster serving my website. So a desired state of that can be declared, and then if something goes offline, it just handles deploying that extra node for you. Uh, you usually would do this manually or by an API call, and that's still very valid here, but it's nicer to actually start leveraging the tools that we have to, to automate these things. And that's when you're getting into those more sophisticated deployments, and when we say sophisticated, it's sophisticated to configure once, but then it's far, very easy to run those environments because they're quite resilient. Yes, sir? I'm staying very generic. I just happen to say Docker because that's the cool word, right? But no, here I'm just talking about in general all containers. And when we get into the various different choices you can make in these orchestration platforms, uh, you know, I'll get more specific about when you choose this, you may use these types of containers. And so uh, sneak peek ahead, all of these orchestration platforms support Docker images. So that's kind of a go-to choice in the industry these days. They're definitely leading the charge. But if you're more of a native LXC user, it, I'm still talking about that as well. All right. <clears throat> so when we have this concept of replicas, if I want three instances of my web heads, for example, running and available to the world, I can declare that once in what we call a desired state, and then it will ensure that that is a true statement over time. We can then, instead of just saying that singular thing like my web head should, be, should have three instances, I can group an entire application stack together, or maybe just facets of my application together, and have that be auto-scaled as well. We're scaling a lot of things here, but okay. Um, you can do that, this seems a little redundant from what I said just a moment ago, but I can have any number of triggers that kick that sort of behavior off. CPU utilization is a main reason that we seem to care. We don't want to overburden our, our host machines, so we want to disperse our workloads as evenly across our cluster as makes sense for our workloads or as tightly coupled and filling those nodes if, if that's more appropriate. So your use case gets to determine that behavior you wish for your cluster to have. Containers have this behavior of being stateless, meaning that they are kind of created and then don't contain and hold that information you may give them. That doesn't mean you can't feed them information to use for their workloads. They are able to cache that information, but it is not persisted uh, once that container's torn back down. We do have the concept of volumes to serve for that purpose. So when we need to persist data permanently, we'll attach some sort of volume, and depending on which technology we choose, there's a few different methodologies of how that behaves, but in the end, there's an attachment that occurs to some sort of permanent storage device uh, in a container form that we would probably call volumes here. And it'll, gener oh, oop. And it'll generate uh, all of that for you if you've already declared that. That's what's nice. Instead of having to make you wrestle that and build a new volume every time you need persistent storage, um, you can trust that that's something you can just continue to rely on. Now, for service discovery, oh, yes, sir. So yes, if that's where my volume lives, in a containerized world, you almost don't care that these are on different nodes unless that's inhibiting your workload. We can fly that data through a wire to another node in our cluster because they are sentiently managed by one orchestration platform. So my volume could live on a completely different host than my container that needs to persist that data. And it'll, it'll actually handle all of that network routing for you. So that's, that's an extremely powerful aspect of these orchestration platforms is to not have that burden of having to either 
have them exist on the same node or figure out how to bolt them together because networking is one of those sort of difficult things in a container world when you deal with it on a per container basis. When you're using tooling like this, it becomes quite elementary. It goes back to very simplistic sort of approaches that you would have expected from very dedicated rigs. Now interior in these systems, they all have some methodologies around how they help you do service discovery. And the two main ways that they'll do that is through either unique identifiers they'll generate for you on a per container basis and they'll keep track of that for you, or some sort of interior to the system DNS system to where I can use a very name-based relationship to a container location. So depending on which way you choose, and some tools have one or the other or both, you can then uh, trust that finding the endpoints for your various functions of service inside your cluster is an easy solution now. And then, and then that couples very much with those defined endpoints. So with the management platforms, they will define those endpoints for you. They'll keep track of that service catalog. So when it's time to bolt something into your environment, a webhead that needs to talk to a load balancer on one direction and a database in another, it can handle that mapping for you. And those can live on very different parts of the cluster um, if you find that appropriate or very resident to one another if that's more appropriate for your performance. Now, when we monitor and do auto healing or even auto scaling, we're gonna monitor those resources that are being utilized at both the host level and potentially at the container level as well. But now we have the concept of taking that at a much larger tier of the grouping of containers. I can define my app to be this 10 container stack and treat that as a whole entity at this point. And then you'll apply health checks for that sort of behavior. So uh, depending on what kind of container behavior we're talking about, it could be something as simple as ping or HTTP checks, or it could be something more elaborate like a custom defined uh, check that comes from the application you're running. So if your application's exposing some information that you wanna monitor against, you just need to write that sort of in. I'm sure there's something that was important at the bottom of this slide. Load balancing, we kind of teased that a second ago. Uh, load balancing is native here, so it's inherent in our industry that from dedicated machines to cloud to containers that we are going to need to horizontally scale. And when we do, we need to route that traffic accordingly. So load balancing functions are native to all of our orchestration platforms and will be managed by the tooling itself. So declare that you want this behavior, let it configure and bolt those things together, and then when you scale, it can understand where these things live and automatically network those things together. You have your kind of two choices down at the bottom of the behaviors of these quite simplistic load balancers with the typical round robin based on the DNS or based on the IP or address space that you have in those containers. And then the load balancer is going to be where you expose some endpoint to your, to your clientele, your outside user or whatever this hooks to. Rolling updates, the biggest pain we have in the maintenance world of, of containers is now my container is stale. I need to reauthor the image for that container. Now that I've reauthored them, I need to figure out how to find and replace all my containers in my infrastructure with the new info. Done. This will handle that. Aim it at, uh, author a new container, tell it about that, and there's actually commands in all the various platforms to say, let's perform this rolling update. Find all of the ones that were this, replace them with that, and then you have throttles and levers to say, let's do that one at a time, 10 at a time, whatever makes sense to, to allow you the update without downtime. Minimal to no downtime at that point. All right, so let's talk about the particular choices you could make. So great question earlier, was I specifically speaking about Docker? No, but in all of these tools, you'll see that they all support the big beast that lives in our container world. So Docker images are the number one choice in how you author your containers, and therefore every tool that I know of at this point in time anyway will support that as one choice of how you could do it. So the different uh, con container orchestration implementations will give you things like Docker Swarm as one choice. The Mesosphere, Apache Mesos comes with Mesosphere Marathon. Google gifted to the world something called Kubernetes, and I'll dive into that one in a little more detail after this conversation. And then we have third-party platforms where you can do this if you didn't want to stand up your own clusters in your data center. You can do that in Amazon. They have their container surface. Microsoft has theirs. Google has theirs, and if you've never played with cluster management, I would say Rackspace themselves, that poster in the back right there, Karina, is free to all. Go get your hands on this, try it. It's specifically running on Docker Swarm today if you wanna try that, but 
Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to sneak peek, but just around the corner, you'll have that option for Kubernetes as well inside Karina. That's free to all, not free when you give me a credit card, but free to all, no credit card required. Go play while it's in beta because they're gonna productize that and it's gonna be hot on the heels of a really sought after platform there. So go get your hands on this and today you can play with Docker Swarm, tomorrow you can play with Kubernetes and really try this for free and get your head around the concepts, try those commands and then see what your workloads look like in these uh, containerized worlds. When we talk about Docker Swarm, surprise, surprise, they only support Docker containers, okay? Uh, not, not really too um, surprising there. They've, they own the lion's share of the market when it comes to your container images of choice, so they don't really find it necessary to support anyone else's options there. Um, the problem I find with Docker is as they roll forward, they don't always maintain backwards compatibility, so make sure that you're staying up to speed with those latest and greatest versions and features, or at least aware of the versions you're using to understand what you have. And as of, I believe, this Monday, they released the version 1.12 release candidate one. So uh, that's pretty, pretty fresh information there. Docker Machine can be used to create a swarm cluster, and it'll handle things like auto-scaling, the service discovery, and load balancing, and all that sort of stuff for you. When we get into the Apache land, if you're familiar with it, oh, yes, sir. I don't know if it provides DNS. I'm not sure. Um, it has its own machine IDs or container IDs that it's using to address each of those as UUIDs. Uh, I don't know if it also has that kind of interior DNS method. Apache Mesos supports the Apache Mesos containers, AppC, as well as Docker containers. Runs on every OS, so you can feel quite agnostic if you're running in a diverse crowd of folks who use different platforms for their operating system. Ships JSON data with, through a RESTful API and also has its own web interface. And then by design, it always tries to deploy your environment as a highly available environment. So one of the approaches it took out of the box was, if you're gonna use this, you're really trying to aim for production workloads, therefore you're trying to eliminate single points of failure, so it's going to deploy in that fashion. Stateful applications can then save their information with persistent storage volumes. That's true here, but it's true in all of them as well. It handles all of the scheduling to determine where in your cluster you should build your next uh, particular uh, container. And then it handles service discovery, load balancing, and plenty more that is on the floor. Kubernetes, I'm just gonna table that for now. This is Google's choice, but we're gonna get a whole slide deck in just a second to give you a little glimpse under the hood there. Uh, get a little nerdy on that one in just a moment. But hey, surprise, surprise, supports Docker containers. Didn't even change that. Look, you could click and that still supports Docker containers over there on the Amazon cloud. Uh, really what they do at the Amazon Container Services, they take some Amazon EC2 instances and then they use them as a cluster for your containers. So if you're used to using their, ser their cloud server services at EC2, you're using those same servers, you're just using them for this containerized purpose. It also bolts into the other Amazon products, which I think uh, 973 of them at this point, and uh, I've been talking for a little while, so it's probably up to 974 now. They're releasing new features and products every minute, it seems. They're fast innovators. But the main things people really go to, go to Amazon and, and latch on to when they're using their container services are these identity uh, management so that you can not worry about having to run an LDAP system or Active Directory for all your auth needs. They use elastic block storage for their persistent volumes, and then the elastic load balancers for that, uh, for that tier of routing. Azure, Microsoft uh, is uh, already supporting the Docker containers, you know, again. Uh, and they one day believe that they will launch their own version of a container and they'll intend to support those as well. It is built off of the concepts of Apache Mesos. So, you know, they're starting to realize Linux is kind of cool and Apache Mesos was free to all. So they grabbed that, they kind of modified it for their infrastructure and then intend to publish their own sort of container um, authoring choice. GCE, the Google Container Engine, so we can say it all together now, supports Docker containers, right? Uh, we didn't all say it, but I'll, I won't hold it against you. Um, it's used to manage these Google Compute instances. So again, like Amazon, if you're used to using their cloud servers, they just take a, a few of those and then they treat them as a container cluster. So why I bring that up in this slide deck is, you know, if you spin down containers in most places, you think about shrinking your footprint and then third-party clouds, you think about shrinking your bill. But at Amazon and Azure and Google, you're spending for the servers always. 
just because you shrink down the number of containers there, you didn't remove any servers. Your bill is not changing. But you're using these servers in a really dynamic way with containers. Uh, it's built on Kubernetes, which we'll talk a bit more about in a little while. And it's integrated with the Google suite of tools. So things like Google Cloud Logging or VPN, if you really want to pretend you have security in this environment, you can at least get some encryption. Now, lots of different things to compare. And when you're choosing what's right for you, you should think about does it support the kinds of containers I use? If I'm using LXC, uh, that trims away some choices, right? If I'm using the Windows containers, that's not a thing. If I'm using Docker, total freedom of choice. Uh, when we say adoption, you know, you can compare what's popular. Docker Swarm is, is out there, but it's actually not the most popular. When, uh, when a poll around July, I'll show you the data at the end of this, a poll at the end of the July really showed that Kubernetes is, is, is taking over the lion's share of orchestration platforms. But at the same time, the container of choice is Docker Images. Um, number of contributors I care about immensely. When I go look at the types of open source technologies I choose, I care immensely about how many contributions are happening, how, how often that's happening, but also the diversity of those. If it's one company constantly bludgeoning the git commits, then they are steering that ship. It is not, it is not all of us together as a community. So I really like to look at, you know, how many different angles and perspectives, countries and, and whatever are shaping a technology. And you know, OpenStack, for example, is a great example of a technology that has extreme diversity in its commits. And I look for that when I go and serve uh, you know, open source technologies into production environments. You definitely need to make sure that the pr platform you're choosing has the services you need, and if you need it, the support you're after. So if you need an escalation path, you know, Microsoft is really trying to uh, emerge as a real strong player there. You know, if you're using Karina, Rackspace is branded as the leader in that support. Amazon, kind of hard to find a phone number for. Google, same sort of thing. So it kind of just depends on what you need there, and you pick and choose according to your use case. And then if you need to, integrate with a with a public cloud. I think it's getting more and more common to have your private data center burst into some third party cloud, especially if you have seasonal workloads, if you run like a costume shop or you're a heavy hitter on Black Friday for the holiday season, those sorts of things. You might care immensely about how well does my choice in technologies burst into my cloud provider of choice. So you might need to weigh that. The appendix here, I just have that thing I teased you about, which was, which container orchestration tool does your organization use? You can see Kubernetes at the top. Docker Swarm's not even number two. A lot of people have had to bake their own solutions, and that's still a good chunk of the market share. I think that'll fizzle out now that we have so many choices, but today Kubernetes reigns supreme. Docker Swarm's up there, and you see Mesos is trickling further down. I'm a huge fan of uh, CoreOS Fleet and definitely a fan of OpenStack Magnum. They just don't have as much user base. I think that'll change, especially as Magnum matures um, down the road. But today, since Kubernetes kind of wins, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that. Is there any questions that, or comments or anything y'all would like to throw at me before we really jump into that next section? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I don't know. This isn't my poll. This is just a pretty chart somebody threw in a deck they gave me Monday. <laughs> Transparency in our industry. Yeah, I mean, I cite my sources. It's a PDF. It just depends on where they are in that life cycle. If they've moved to production, they've probably settled on a stable selection. But I think a lot of people who are playing in the container space are still trying to figure out what's perfect for them. And even if they're using a production environment, they may still be trying to figure out exactly which one's working best for their workload. So in my consulting you know, sort of interactions, I find people are playing with one and looking to try another because there's some shortcomings. And I don't think they've really found their sweet spot yet kind of across the board. For the production workloads, I've really seen going strong with a single set of technologies. Kubernetes as the orchestration platform is the choice. Uh, Docker Swarm as well is a great alternative if you're using Docker containers, but it's rigidly locked to only Docker uh, in, that, in that arena. Sure. Well, I mean, it happens. I mean, I kind of, I, I would love to answer it with that gentleman's answer, but I mean, people do it. 
Is this ideal for running databases? No, I mean, I think we understand that databases probably like a little bit of rigid iron, especially if you want them to be highly performant databases. But in the day and age where we have polyglot data centers or polyglot databases where you might have some MySQL over here and coupled with some Mongo and to speed it up, you bolt it in some Redis, and that kind of works well in a containerized world. You might have a dedicated iron cluster of MySQL, but your Mongo or your Redis might be running, you know, your Mongo might be running a, in a container with a persistent volume attached. Your Redis is running in a, you know, a couple of containers, uh, you know, for whatever caching layer or whatever it does in your arena, just to get that lightning fast approach that Redis can, can deliver. So I think it's uh, still to be determined, but I think most people in production workloads still remember that you know, you want that database really resiliently living in iron. In the back, sir, JJ. Can I just throw in another real comment? Yeah, please. As a matter of fact, uh, go ahead. But I'm going to throw a microphone at you if you said that those comments get captured. Um, well, on the database story also, the reason why people won't get to Amazon ETS, if you have RDS attached to it, with Google, you get their So, so when you look at the databases, it kind of just when you decide the um, the backend you choose, uh, you can take advantage of it, like with RDS, with um, Amazon, or the Google, whatever the hell that one is. Um, but you get the point, right? And when you buy into that 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 ecosystem, then as I made that little joke about laughing about databases, yeah, you don't have to worry about having that massive EC2 instance running your database and worry about the failover. You just have an API, an API or Postgres endpoint that ECS or that uh, uh, RDS takes care of. Yeah. Very good. Any other? Uh, just hang on to it for now. Um, any other questions, comments, war stories? All right, cool. Let's dive into some Kubernetes. Give me just one sec. All right, so Kubernetes, who knows what this means? Sweet, there's a cheat sheet right there. All right, so uh, who wants to tell me? Come on, somebody read. Here, I'll literate. Yeah, that. Okay, excellent. Getting right in. So what is it and what are some concepts of Kubernetes? If this gets a little heady for you, no worries. If you haven't worked with Kubernetes, you're going to look at code and that's going to be ugly, but no live demos because I'm not going to have it fail that bad. <laughs> Somebody's tried live demos. Um, all right, so Kubernetes is one of the choices you can make in these uh, management tiers for your platform for containers so that you can manage an entire cluster and let it appropriately determine your your container behaviors for optimal performance. Now there is some need on your part to describe what optimal performance would mean to you. Uh, is that bunch them up all real close so they can talk very quickly or is that spread them all out so we're eliminating single points of failure? You know, that's a really custom answer for your workloads, your business, your production uh, cycles there. But it's gonna give you the basics of deploying new containers, maintaining them, scaling them, and all that, and it can treat them as individual little snowflakes or you know, a, a bunch in a group that make up your application stack. And then it uses the concept of declarative primitives, or uh, I guess we hear that as desired state. So tell me how you want it to look, and I will try to keep it that way. That's kind of the methodology there. Now we'll get in there and you can see down at the bottom here we have a lot of vocabulary to sort of chew on. I think everybody is pretty comfortable with the concept of a node, but we'll get into the weird stuff like pods and things that Kubernetes uses. So a node or a minion node is going to be your uh, individual host machines that are going to have containers living on them. Right? To differentiate that, we also have our master node, which is like our controller node, that's gonna run the control plane tools that manipulate those minions to perform your containerized deployments. So on the minions themselves, we have a few pieces that run, specifically kubelet and kube proxy, one for managing the individual creation and life cycle of the containers themselves, and one for handling the network side of things. Right? On the master node, we have API endpoints, and then we also have the scheduler, which is making those decisions about where the next container shall live. And then we also have something called controller managers, which manage controllers. Hmm. So uh, taking a look at a kind of a simple diagram here, on the left, our master node, you can see kubectl, our command line tool to interact with this, is going to be, allow you that command line interaction for the API. 
Uh, when we reach out with that stuff, we'll be hitting the master node, and that'll provide our authentication and authorization layers. We'll have at the bottom, you can see schedulers and the controller manager, and then some distributed storage, if you're doing those persistent volumes, could live in that realm. You could also have those in some storage cluster elsewhere, if that was appropriate in your data center. And then all this wielded through that API. Now our minion nodes are just nodes out in the wild. These are the set of host machines we've declared as the places our containers will live. Kubelet and Proxy are running out there. And Kubelet's gonna manage what we call pods, and I'll talk about those a little bit more. Pods are just collections of containers and how you define a pod is up to you, but I think a lot of people are sanely choosing when I talk about we can manage our individual uh, containers or this group of containers we call our application. That grouping is likely how you will define your pod or one school of thought on it anyway. Um, in there, you know, I mean, it could be Docker, that certainly makes a ton of sense. Well, VMs live on physical machines. So, I mean, in, in the world, it's probably a virtual machine. You're probably building out physical machines, hypervising them, and then, uh, and then building VMs that you're then clustering, especially if you're using a third-party cloud provider. They're most guaranteed to be a virtual machine, but they, they, they could be either. It could be either, right. But, uh, you know, virtual machines just live on some of you know, the clouds, just somebody else's computer. So there's still physical infrastructure under there. All right, uh, and then you know, if we need to have exterior communication, the uh, cube proxy is gonna handle that network layer that exposes something to the outside world. Now, when we use a web dashboard here in Kubernetes, it's gonna run on the master node, and I don't think it requires a whole lot of conversation to explain what a web UI does for you. Just gives you an easy web portal to go do a vast majority of the things we do with Kubernetes, but I think if you've ever worked in a web UI versus the command line alternative to such a thing, you're gonna get a feature-rich command line that isn't always 100% parity to the web interface. But web interfaces are gonna get you a vast majority of the way down the road with Kubernetes. It makes it quite easy to sort of click through and, and wield an entire cluster. The CLI is where a lot of people do their work and all of my examples, at least for this talk, are gonna show those CLI interactions. It's not really fun to just watch a mouse move around and click, although I guess that's cool too, but I'll show you actually under the hood what you would run a few commands. And in lieu of a uh, live demo, I'll show you the command and some arguments you'll pass and then the output you should expect to see at the bottom. So when I'm just running a new, in, uh, new container, I'll call it echo server, I pass a few parameters like the image I'm going to use to deploy that and as well as a port I wanna expose from there, press enter, I have a container come to life. In this case, whatever I named it, in this case, echo server. Now the pods, that's those logical groupings of multiple containers and you get to define what this means to you. So maybe that's just uh, some number of containers and that's how you care to manage them. Maybe it's the eight containers that make up your app stack or whatever it is, right? Um, so you get to define what they are and then it will manage these pod creations and instructions for you as sort of a whole entity at a greater higher of order than just a single um, container. Now we think of, the of them as the smallest deployable unit that can be managed. A container is great, but we like to think of containers as doing just a singular function and not really comprising the entire app stack. Now I've seen plenty of deployments where the single container is exactly what they do, especially if like you're code rendering or transcoding with containers. You might have a pod that's 10 of these and when you need you know, more compute or you know, transcoding power, you build another pod which is 10 more of these containers that all just keep transcoding. So they're all identical but you kind of have a pod as a logical grouping to understand how to scale that. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, at the bottom, pod definitions is a declarative statement of desired state. I would like to have three of these. If one of them goes offline, it finds a place to put a third one. If I don't have, uh, if I have three nodes, it will ideally spread those across three nodes if that's how you prefer to not co-locate your app to make sure and eliminate single points of failure. But if you're trying to saturate CPUs, you may want all three of those pods living on the same node and then filling up that node before they go to node two, filling up node two before node three. Uh, if no, one of those nodes goes offline and you lose one of the pods that was in your desired count of three, it will find the next most appropriate node. And based on how you explained you wanted it to behave in your desired state, it will choose a node that tries to make that a true statement. Now when we try to write and define a pod, we write all of these instructions in YAML. How many people have worked in YAML? 
Put your hand down, chef guy. That's Ruby. <laughs> You're not an Ansible guy. Um, no, but anyway, I think YAML is becoming quite ubiquitous across quite a few tools, especially when you're talking about non-programmer-based tools. Really, your, um, your operator tools are giving them a really lightweight language like YAML to write so that they don't have to go curly brace uh, JSON their lives away. Um, so you can see a very simple example of defining a pod. Notice that we call it by kind. Uh, that's an argument here that will define what we're doing here, and here we're defining a pod. And then you can see some metadata that we're supplying, and this is not arbitrary. We do need to name our, our thing, right? In this case, it's a pod. And then we have specifications. The spec lists out what exact containers are going to be in there, the images those containers are built from, and if we expose a port, what port that's going to be. Now I can build this pod over and over and over again. So if I create a single container pod in a deployment, I have the kubectl, that command line tool again, run, and then I'm going to name it example, point it to an image. And in this case, I have an image named Nginx. What's Nginx? Web server. Yeah. So just creating a little web head container here. That simple command brings that to life. The deployment is created. Now when I want to create a pod, I actually, instead of pointing it to an image, I point it to a file. If I wrote this file and I saved it as mypod.yaml, point it to dash F file, that YAML file, and now it creates this entire thing. Now, in this case, that's the same thing as my single instance here, my single container here, uh, but it could be far more elaborate, and it would have created that whole pod with this single command. I know, right? Nice. Labels, labels are just key value pairs that mean what you need them to mean. So whatever data you're needing to keep track of or assign out, you can define labels. It uses this keyword labels and then just start delineating your key value pairs. Uh, for those of you who know YAML, you'll recognize that's a two-space indentation. It's kind of the, the main premise of how you write YAML is this college note-taking indentation method. Uh, so it makes it really easy to sort of work with. If you work with it often you know, in a tool like Sublime Text like I do, you snap in a module for that and your tab key becomes a two-space. Uh, your life is all simple again. And they can be attached, these labels, whatever they need to be for you, can be attached at the creation of these pods or containers, uh, but they can also be added or modified later in the life cycle. If all of a sudden you needed some more kind of data for this, added on there, or updated if that's appropriate. And what this allows you to do is sort of use these labels for targeting purposes. So examples of this are if I created some set of labels, let's look at these. Up here I'm showing release could have a few arguments, right? Maybe I'm on release stable or release canary or whatever it is. If maybe I have three different environments, dev, QA, and production, I might want to use the labels for that. That way when I want to target something, I can say everything that's in dev, do something partitions or tracks or whatever, just some examples here. But if you look over here, we can see how that can then be used to target via the selectors. So with selectors, I can actually come in with the set-based selectors, which uses this as sort of an or operator, if this is production or QA. Whereas if I uh, come down here and use a comma separated value outside of parens, then I am using an and operator, if that is production and not in the front end tier this not operator and in the exclamation point. So now we have kind of metadata key value pairs, if you will, that allow us to target the things that we have in the wild. So if I create a container, it's in production, I can maybe supply this key value pair that says the environment it's in is production. Now when I need to do work on my production nodes, maybe a rolling update, for example, I can say find all the ones that are in production and replace them with the ones from QA. The controller is what's managing your pods. We saw that on that very initial diagram that we saw. And it run, runs in the controller manager. That makes a ton of sense. They named that one sanely. Um, and then we have these two types, replication controllers and deployment controllers. They're kind of self-explanatory, um, but to say the least, managed at the master node level. And then we'll issue commands out into the minion nodes if work needs to be done. When I'm looking at defining a replication controller, pretty simple in the YAML again. Give some metadata like a name like Nginx, spec it. I want three replicas of the app Nginx and then some template that defines what that is. Do I show the template? I do, excellent. So the template could look like this. Here I'm supplying some of those labels. I got that metadata name again and now I'm specking out a name Nginx. I'm using the Nginx image, exposing a port. Now when I want to bring this to life, well I'll put a box around it first I guess. Oh there's your template, right? 
Oh, I thought I had given you the uh, command to run that. Maybe I do after this. Um, either way, you bring it to life with a very simple one-liner command. The replica set is kind of like a replication controller uh, implementation. And it's going to use those set-based selectors. This is when you're using those targeting labels so that you can say, do work on these particular factions of my environment. So if I say, write that replication YAML file. Well, I don't show it. But I write a replication YAML file. And then I run this command pointing the create-f at it. And I'll get some sort of output that says, you know, this has occurred. Now, after it's occurred, I can say describe. And after I run that top command, if I describe it right away, we'll see that nothing is alive yet. Three are waiting to come to life. Nothing succeeded or failed yet. Give it some time, however long it takes to build containers. Run that command again, and we can see now we have three running, that desired state that we had declared. When we talk about services, this is really easy to define and then bring to life. And it's sort of like the policy of your logical groups. So what is the function they provide? Define that as a service. And so when we look at what that looks like, we don't, I guess, look at what that looks like yet. Um, we'll define things like the internal IP that these will communicate on between the containers. And then that will be where we're exposing that connectivity or functionality to the other containers, right? The node port is what exposes this to the external traffic. That could be external to the world, but that could just be external in your infrastructure. So it's still intranet, but it's exterior to your cluster. And then load balancer, yeah, this load balances. Yes, go right ahead. No, that's fine. They can, they can listen on the same ID. It can keep track of that and use a load balancer to farm that out to the various members. And for logical collection, they'll, each of those images or each of those containers will have a unique identifier that the cluster's managing for you. So if, uh, if my app is going to have 10, 10 containers that all do the same thing on the same port, they're going to do that through a load balancer to where we don't have to care which container does the work, just that the work gets done. Sure. On the physical the node itself, the traffic coming in is gonna there's no need to map the port eighty, you only map one, right? Yes. So how so if you ran many containers in say like three nodes. Well, so at that point you'd use like these IPs or DNS DNS entries to segregate those. Because if they're completely separate, they're not part of that same fleet. Yes, true. Does that make sense? So that's pretty traditional answers for how we do that, and that would still hold true here in just in a containerized world. In an ephemeral port, sort of. And and that and if it gets more complex, that's the point of that proxy subservice that's running there is to keep track of. If we've got weird additional ports that are running for all the various apps in there, it all came in on port 80, but that proxy is kind of keeping track of how to route that correctly once I'm in the cluster. Any other questions before we roll on? Yeah, in back of the room. Sure, maybe. No, I'm not going down the, the networking stack in this in this talk anyway. Trying to probably burn through just a few short more topics because I know we got another speaker that's going to talk with us today. I love geeking out on that though. So once I get a chair out there, maybe maybe I'll take a chair next to you, <laughs> or maybe I'll avoid you entirely because it's also a little bit terrifying. All right. So when we define one of these services, it looks quite simple again in that YAML. Look, we're declaring those ports. What kind of protocol target port here? Um, and then our selector, if we're targeting on something like app, my app, that's those labels we defined. And then when I want to bring that to life, point it at the file. And then it comes to life. And then when I need to see what's running, kubectl get services. We'll list out all the services I've brought to life. And if I need to tear one back down, I've got the delete command and just name the service that you wish to delete. 
deployments. And I think this is probably the last topic, if I recall correctly, that we'll really go down the rabbit hole on, but it's the same sort of thing. This is where you're defining an entire desired state that can include pods with replica sets, the full gamut here. And so you'll, you'll define that all, guess what, in YAML, and bring it to life with a simple set of commands, or simple command, and then manipulate it with a few others. Uh, but this is going to actually uh, create new resources if you don't have enough. If you said desired state three and you don't have three, it creates more. If you, uh, for some reason, needed to auto scale up due to an event you had, a, you had defined and it auto scaled beyond that three on the desired state, it's also paying attention to tear that back down when it's okay to get it back down to three. So auto scaling is bi-directional. Um, and a lot of people think about like, I need to burst up, but you also wanna tear that back down when you don't need it anymore to free up those resources. And then it can be things like updated or rolled out initially. So kubectl run echo server pointed at an image, give it a port, the deployment echo server is created. And this is a new deployment. Now I'm defining a new pod for the specified image here. And that would in this case be very uninteresting. It's just a single container in this example, uh, but it does bear the at least the example here. When we look at what those files would look like when we define the deployment, it's really interesting on the right side, the spec side where I'm defining the number of replicas. I delineate out my template as to what that uh, deployment should look like. And you know, I could get very complex here. This just shows one simple label naming my app as well as one simple container running Nginx on a single predictable port of 80. Um, and then I bring that to life over here. Create dash F that Nginx deployment dot YAML. It says it's created, get deployments. If I fire that first command and then immediately follow right here, I'm gonna get three are desired, but nothing's alive. It's only been one second, right? Tap your toes for about 17 more seconds. And then it's able to bring those up. Desired was three, I currently have three. Three are up to date, three are currently available to the end user on that port you declared. All right. When I need to do updates on those deployments, I have the edit keyword there, pointed at one of your deployments, deployment slash nginx dash deployment. And then I can edit things. If this is how you would add or remove or modify those labels, for example, that I said were possible to do post creation. If I wanna do rollouts, I have a whole keyword just for that. So I've, I'm replacing you know, something in my infrastructure of containers and I wanna do the rollout of that. I've got this keyword for that. Oops, but that broke the whole infrastructure, so I've got an undo, that's really nice. And then um, if I want to see um, a specific version, so I've done updates, I've rolled them out, I've rolled them out, I've rolled them out, and I've kept versions, I can actually roll back to a specific revision that are enumerated from zero counting forward. So, you know, if I continue to roll out over the same infrastructure over and over and over again, it's keeping those revisions, provided you keep the same files, you, you have to keep those files so that it remembers that information, it can go back to whatever revision was appropriate. So we rolled forward, we didn't notice we broke some small piece of our infrastructure, we rolled forward again, nobody noticed it yet, roll forward a third time, somebody freaks out, finally went and used that feature, we might have to roll back four versions, right, or three versions, whatever I just said. I can actually go back in my catalog and say, oh, we're on four today, oh, but two was where that worked, cool. And, uh, and then I can roll right back to that. And so all of the like updating and rollback maintenances, nightmares that you may have lived in the operator's life or administrator's life that you may have walked in, I mean, that kind of goes away. It's very easy to heal from problems in a containerized world because deployments are so fast. Um, resources are defined in YAML in that declarative style. Kind, right here, you would say things like pod or replication controller, service, whatever it might be and then you start supplying the various pieces and parts to define that. Here are uh, your, your uh, some examples here. So if I have foo.yaml, and I'm taking a look at that, you can see the specs that I put in there, and I've got uh, like an image called busybox, create foo.yaml, and it go ahead, goes ahead and brings that to life. Get it, and it'll list out what you got. Now I'm writing that out to some file. Now I can actually go count the temp.yaml, and see that I have 51 in foo and eight in temp. Service discovery, one of the biggest uh, pains in container world, has two nice environmental variable keywords here, where when I set up new services, I just create service name underscore service under host, 
and then service name, service port, as these environmental variables now easily discovered. When I say connect to my database, I might have database underscore service under host, if we're doing that in a container, right? Some people were freaking out there. I totally understand why. And then I would have that running on some port, like, I don't know, 3306, just to pick it. And uh, then it could easily discover and attach to those things. I also have DNS, so I can set DNS records for each of these services, and that is, here we're talking about Kubernetes, and that's a nice feature. Some of the others provide that feature, some of them do not. Okay, so sometimes you have to use unique identifiers or have a, an entirely different methodology about service discovery in, in the other platforms you could be choosing. Load balancing looks quite simple. Give it some ports and a target port, and then your selector is targeting those labels that you've put on your different pods or, or containers. Tell it what type it is, and then give it some ranges here. Auto scaling, the fun stuff. When this all he uh, grows or shrinks for you as your load dictates or as your triggers dictate, it's not always load, load, whatever that means to you. And then that'll uh, automatically scale the number of pods in the replication controller, the deployments, the replica sets, and then it will use different metrics to do so. A very common one to use is the CPU utilization on the hosts themselves, but I think far more people are starting to actually leverage their application to expose some information that they choose to trigger upon. And I think that's gonna become really the better way to do it. That way it's more honest to when you need to scale your app. If you're running a simple you know, three-tier webhead database kind of load balancing thing going on, I think it's pretty uh, simple to use CPU. But when you're talking about mobile apps or data rendering or trans transcoding data, it might be more important for you to really specify something in your app that shouts out when it's, hey, this hurts, now scale me. And that's becoming a more and more common thing to write. All right. Rolling updates, we do these in dedicated servers now. We've been doing them in cloud for quite some time here in containers. While we always have done them in our maintenance windows in my world, uh, now it's actually easy to let the tooling do that for you. Have someone standing by in case it bursts into flames, but other than that, you can just let this roll forward and just fire and forget in most cases. Aim it at the new image uh, for the containers, point it to the infrastructure where the old are, let it roll that out. And you have some levers as to how how much of that goes on at a time. Jobs are probably, like, this is the last thing I think they gave me to talk about. And so jobs are something that you'll complete, uh, or something that you'll define to its completion. And it will create this infrastructure, perform the task, and when the task is done, it will tear down the infrastructure and consider job complete. Taking a look at what that would look like if I look at, uh, what am I doing here? Not a very interesting thing to do in this work, right? I'm just gonna wait 20 seconds. But given this definition here, I could do something like create that file, and then I'll say describe the running jobs, right? And I'll see that one is running, none have succeeded or failed yet. We'll get these metrics on the finish, on the completion of jobs. Did it work or did it not work? This one waits 20 seconds, sleeps 20 seconds. Wait 20 seconds later, we'll get one succeeded, zero failed. But it, notice it also tore down that infrastructure. We don't have any of those containers running anymore. This is great when you have uh, you know, routine work. Every night at midnight, we take a backup, and we do that with some sort of containerized approach. Do the thing. Tell me it succeeded. I feel very good. But don't leave the infrastructure running. I've seen this used a lot in my world for the test dev workloads that they might have. You know, run my suite of tests against my particular, you know, code base, uh, call it a Git code base or something like that, run my test suite against it. But when you're done, I don't need those containers you spun up to do that to live anymore. I just want to know that it worked and then those containers got torn down. And that'll all just happen on the back end on its own. Yay, that is our show. Anybody have any questions? I think, uh, yeah, in production, HA is the way to go. So if you lose that master node, your, your environment keeps running, right? But you have no scope to put more out there or manage it, right? So you don't want to have that sort of situation. So I definitely recommend. So do I? Yes. Um, but, you know, in your use case, is that vital? Depends, right? But uh, best practice would say yes, HA for the master node. What else? Sir? Backing up... Uh uh, the, <clears throat> sorry, not the slide, backing up oh. containers. Uh, 
uh, is that pretty much the same way as uh, um, backing up the VMs and stuff? Well, so yes and no. I mean, if you understand that data that you need backed up is going to those persistent volumes, those persistent volumes live on some hardware, uh, you know, cloud server, physical machine, whatever that is, and you can back up that machine, then yes. Is it uh, painful? No. It's a slightly different approach to backing this up as it's not really a, a machine or a disk in that sense. Um, yeah, you got to take a slightly different approach, but it's, it's not difficult. Yeah, you can take snapshots, snapshots. yes, yeah, snapshots, perfectly fine, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any of the backup technologies you're using today should work in a containerized infrastructure because you'll just back up those machines. And yeah, specifically where you're wanting to back up is where your persistent volume data lives. Okay, so that's what I was asking. So you do you follow the traditional... Uh, yeah, backup. there's no magic that, that comes to the world just for containers. Yeah, use your traditional approaches. And if these are living on, say, VMs, snapshots are a perfect, perfect choice there. Thanks. Okay. Big round of applause for me. Yeah. No, it's great talking with y'all. Uh, let's keep this party going. Who's up next? <laughs>